This is what I personally have been waiting for for a long time. Nine years, in fact, in the college football playoff. We have TCU, Texas Christian, number three in the country versus number one Georgia. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, and I want to start with just that. These two teams could not be more different in how they got to this game. And that is why I'm so excited to discuss it with you, right? So start with this. TCU rebuilt itself through the transfer portal, which is not make it unlike most every other college football team in FBS. What makes it remarkable is that they won a game you're not supposed to be able to win if you're Texas Christian. That would be a college football playoff semifinal, especially after losing your conference championship in something other than the SEC, right? So let's stick with TCU here for a second. Sonny Dykes takes over a program that had been remade in another man's image for the last 20 years, Gary Patterson, who for many of us is what Texas Christian football is, right? He had done a great job from the WAC to the Mountain West to the Big 12 of evaluating high school talent and then fitting it into his scheme particularly on the defensive side of the ball. One of my favorite examples of this is LJ Collier, right? A guy coming from West Texas who he put on a meal program, said you're going to play defensive end, and he grew into a first-round draft pick. Another one of these guys, Ty Summers, who's going to play some quarterback at Rice, ends up playing defensive end and linebacker at Texas Christian. One on this year's roster, Shadrach Banks, great offensive player. He had turned into the kind of guy that is going to play some outside linebacker at Texas Christian. So you have a foundation there of being able to identify underdeveloped talent and creating an advantage by making something great out of what other people just thought was an okay football player. Sonny Dyke sees this and also says, I need to hire some guys that are not unlike me. They have a Texas background. They have an appreciation for Texas high school football, and they understand the challenge of playing in the Big 12. So he goes and recruits Garrett Riley. Lincoln Riley's little brother, to run his offense, and Joe Gillespie, defensive coordinator at Tulsa, to run his defense. Now, for those of you that do not know, I love Joe Gillespie. He's one of my favorite people in this sport. He's a genuine man. He's always been kind to me. Took time to teach me his defense so that, A, I would sound smart talking about it, and B, I would come to respect it, right? And he did this before he turned Zayvon Collins into a first-round draft pick and the best defensive player in the country in 2020. That's another dude that he identified who was under-recruited and underdeveloped out of Hominy, Oklahoma. Just a small three-star that he grew into a destroyer of worlds that can line up at a foot-nine technique and run down anybody that he wanted to run down. That is who Joe Gillespie is, but he's that guy because he's raised in Stephenville, okay? And I say that to say he played linebacker for Art Bryles when Art Bryles was head coach at Stephenville. Then goes to Angelo State, plays linebacker, comes back, is an assistant for Art Bryles at Stephenville. And he developed a defense that had to go up against what was the most prolific offense in high school football. At one point, that program had the national record for yards produced in a season. Joe Gillespie had to build a defense that could contend with that each and every practice, let alone every game, and then grew into a high school football head coach himself at Stephenville. Left Texas for the first time in his career when his good friend, Philip Montgomery, who was an offensive coordinator at Stephenville, got the head coaching job at Tulsa, asked him to come run some defense. Now, Coach Gillespie was also not very shy about saying when he got to Tulsa, much as he loved it here, he met or his uh, daughter met his, her husband here, graduated here, kid went to high school here. They wanted to get back to Texas. So going just an hour away from Stephenville at Texas Christian was a glove fit for him. And his defense translated to a league where defense is coming back into vogue and has a power five reputation. That's what Texas Christian had at its advantage. A power five reputation, a reputation among these uh, West Texas and Texas high school football coaches where kids would come to play with them. And then with the advent of the transfer portal really coming into vogue, where you are hiring directors of transfer portals and directors of recruiting and on-campus recruiting and off-campus recruiting, and you have a quality control assistants who just watch film on high school players or just watch film on the opponent or just watch film on guys that are in the transfer portal, you can do outstanding evaluation. Texas Christian nailed their evaluation, and sometimes it was just straight up in front of them. 
one respect, Johnny Hodges, who was at Navy until last year, is a guy that played against Tulsa. And Joe Gillespie remembers him. And he recruits him to play some linebacker. And he becomes one of their linchpins next to a guy named Dean Winters, who was underdeveloped, right? And then comes into his own in this 3-3-5 stack where you are reading and reacting, where you are going to clog the middle of the field. You're going to make it hard to run those crossing routes everybody likes to run against you. You're going to be able to pick stuff off, take it back to the house. Ask J.J. McCarthy about that, right? Then you are able to do, and this is the most crucial part of, I think, the defensive development for Texas Christian. You got to teach it. You got to teach how to run that 3-3-5 stack. You have to teach where the safety eyes have to be, and your safety has to be able to play four positions, right? It's one thing to be able to evaluate a great player. It's another thing to be able to teach that great player how to play within your system and make it work. So much so that we still have people that do not respect a 3-3 front because they still believe they're just facing a 3-3 front as opposed to somebody's always going to be coming, right, as a fourth rusher or even a fifth rusher. You're always going to have a third safety that you're not used to seeing. That's why the 4-2-5 was my favorite defense for so long. That third safety you could do so much with, and Gary Patterson was the first to open my eyes to that. Okay, on the offensive side of the ball, you took what you got and didn't break it. You got Chandler Morris over there, who Garrett Riley's familiar with because Chandler Morris played for Lincoln Riley, played in the same uh, kind of scheme, right? But you also have Max Duggan, who was the dude from Council, Iowa, Council Buffs, Iowa, who called up Gary Patterson and said, I want to be a, a Texas Christian Horn Frog and has developed into a great dual threat quarterback, right? On the other side of this, you have Georgia, who has done nothing but build from high school on with some changes in between, right? You remember Darion Kendrick, for example, last year playing on that Georgia defense. But Kirby Smart has done it the way that you and I are used to doing it. You recruit heavily in high school, and you bet on four and five stars, and you recruit them to stay here for the opportunity to compete for national championships. And competing for national championships means you will get what you want as well. Kirby is also that guy who, like Joe Gillespie, stays in a film room and is really great at identifying the guys that can play within his system and how. He is very much on, if I have better players than you have, we will win most games. We might not lose. Because I love pointing this out, the guy that he was working for as the fifth quarter, Nick Saban, he also worked for at Miami, uh, for the Dolphins, when Nick Saban was there. And one of the reasons that Nick Saban became a football coach in college again after leaving Miami Dolphins is he said, in the NFL, you get one first round draft pick. And that's if they haven't traded away from you. In college, he can sign 25. That is who Kirby Smart is. He wants to sign 25 first round draft picks each and every year. And if he hits on more of those than he doesn't, it doesn't really matter that the quarterback isn't the best player on the team. So you also get to say to your quarterback, do you want to be a Georgia Bulldog? Or do you want to play quarterback? Because if you want to play quarterback, you can do that anywhere. But at Georgia, I need guys that want to be Georgia Bulldogs. So take a look at that depth chart. You'll see four and five star guys behind Stetson Bennett. But the reason that Stetson Bennett was getting a nod when the rest of us are looking around at JT Daniels going, this dude is a five star. This dude comes from modern day. This dude's got pedigree. He's saying, no, I want guys that want to be a Georgia Bulldog and are willing to bleed for it. And Stetson was that guy. Walked on at Georgia when Justin Fields was there. My goodness. Goes to Jones Community College. Turns into Uncle Rico. Had one offer from Louisiana before Kirby Smart called him up before an early signing period. And he becomes a Georgia Bulldog once again. And his job is to run the offense for Todd Munkin in such a way that they don't get in the defense's way. Now, here of late, we've got to see him become much more of a runner. But he's also kind of been squirrely here of late for me, right? Especially in these bigger games. Tennessee was the last time I actually saw him step up with some confidence and go win a football game, right? I wonder what's going to happen if Texas Christian can put some, uh, some pressure on him, but there's not going to be a whole lot because behind him, there's Kenny McIntosh, there's Dajan Edwards, there's Kendall Milton. On the outside, there's A.D. Mitchell. There's also, oh my goodness, Brock Bowers, who really didn't get as much run as he should have against Ohio State. And we'll have to wait and see about Darnell Washington. You have all the pieces to be great at Georgia because they nail their evaluation in high school they grow up their dudes by redshirting them, and you are in a culture where is it, expe it is expected for you to be here in the offseason. We don't expect you to go anywhere, and they don't have to. They and Alabama get to say that. Almost no one else does. That is remarkable, right? But even as I'm laying all this out for you, it's still David versus Goliath, right? Because they've got more five stars than you've got by a wide margin. 
Georgia, on talent, is the number two team in the entire country. TCU, by talent, is the number 32 team in the entire country. They should not be here, and yet they are here because the transfer portal and the redshirt rule have made it easy, right? Not easy, easier. So you have the transfer portal coming in, you have the redshirt rule coming in, which is to say that if you are not a Georgia Bulldog or a member of the Alabama Crimson Tide, you might look around and expect to play. And because you didn't play, you'll go into the portal. So a player that Texas Christian might not have been able to get, they can get now. They added 13 different makers to their roster, and they were able to ride that to an undefeated regular season, play well enough in the Big 12 championship game to earn an opportunity to win one football game, 60 minutes. It's real difficult to win 12 in a row. It's harder still to win that one game, 60 minutes, and they got it done because they have put together the perfect blend of transfer, recruiting, knowledge of their area, and meaning to their program. Remarkable what they've done. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.